Therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. Now, the best way I can think of to clear this place out in less than a minute and a half is to start going around and saying, I need the deed to your house. I need, I need the keys to your car. I need, the, I need your whole family. I need your insurance policy. I mean, how many of you? Let's be honest. How many of you would stay? The honest answer is probably none of us. And I think that's part of Jesus' point. When we get too confident in ourselves, oh, I got faith. Oh, God is in my back pocket. God spoke to me. I think I heard somebody imply the other week. When we are so sure that we have God, we can rest assured that we don't. We can know that we have gone astray. And I didn't know that I was preaching on today's hymns so far, but I am. So I ask you all to turn to page 144 and lift every voice and sing. This is the hymn we just sang before today's gospel. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow me. And I know many of you could immediately identify your cross that you're taking up in order to follow Jesus. And it's probably something like my husband drives me crazy because he never puts such and such a way. Or my kid never does his homework. And I always have, and we think of those as our crosses. We make the cross trivial. The cross is the symbol of death. The cross is the symbol of giving up and emptying oneself totally, completely for God. And all too often, you and I trivialize that. And so I can promise you that very few of us and only sometimes and only once in a while take up our true cross in order to follow Jesus. Only sometimes, only once in a while, do we get a glimpse of a vision that is so uplifting to us, that is so fulfilling to us, that we are really ready and willing to sacrifice, to give up all our possessions. The second verse, I'll go with him through the garden, I'll go with him through the garden, I'll go with him through the garden all the way. How preposterous. How many people went with Jesus through the garden? Monday, Thursday. How many people actually followed Jesus through the garden? None. Not a one. Indeed, what did the disciples do while Jesus was in the garden praying? They fell asleep. How preposterous for you or I to think that we're going to do better than those disciples who knew Jesus personally and walked this earth with him. We want to believe We'll stick with Jesus through the garden. We'll stick with Jesus all the way. If you want to become my disciple, give up all your possessions. Well, let's see. Let's get to the third verse. Maybe it gets better. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment all the way. Well, how many disciples were standing there at the cross declaring, I'm with Jesus? The best we get 
is John and another disciple standing kind of back in the crowd with some of the women, thank you, with some of the women. And they weren't raising their hand and saying, I was Jesus, I was Jesus. Indeed, what did Peter do while they were judging Jesus? Denied him. Denied him. I'm not one of him. I'm not with him. What makes us think we would do any better? Folks, this hymn says what we would like to be like and what we would like to do. But the truth is, we are no more likely to actually do these three verses than the disciples themselves were. Just like those first disciples and followers of Jesus, you and I are going to fail. And as long as we're filled with self-righteousness and say, no, I've got God behind me, God is telling me what to do, we know we are lost. The only stanza of this verse that gives, makes any sense and that gives us any hope is the last one. Everyone turn to page 144 in this book. And we're going to read together verse 4. 144, verse 4. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. And, glory and go with me, with me all the way. The only hope you or I or any other human being on this earth now or in the past or in the time to be. Our only hope is God's grace and glory and the hope that God will go with me all the way. It's not that you or I are going to do a single darn thing for God. It's God is going to do greater things for us than we can imagine. But God has given us free will. God has given us choice. In our first reading from Jeremiah, that wonderful, my favorite prophet, because he realized that everything that was going to come out of his mouth was going to alienate the people around him, and he wasn't comfortable with that. It was Jeremiah's job to say to the good, God-fearing folk of Israel, you got it wrong. It was Jeremiah's job to say to the good folk of Israel, you know, you can't be sure you have God with you in your back pocket. God will not be controlled by you. And you are not so smart that you can enter into negotiations, that you can make deals with other powers and principalities and assume that God will be on your side, will remain on your side, and has to bless, protect, keep, and prosper you. God does not have to do a darn thing. God has already done absolutely everything for us in creating us, in sustaining us, in sanctifying us, in walking with us all the way. We are the ones dependent on God. And just as, and it's interesting because I love this passage, but, you know, I have always taken this passage from Jeremiah as a, a personal thing, that God will mold me, melt me, shape me. But Jeremiah is not talking about individual people here. Who's, Jer who's Jeremiah speaking about? Who is it that God is going to mold? Who is it that God is going to destroy and reform if they stray too far? It's the whole people of God. It's the nation of Israel. Which, 
thanks to whoever chose our hymns. I am going to suggest that this morning's hymn is one we could sing every Sunday between now and November of 2020. And I'm dead serious about that. Now get out the hymnal, which is not black like mine. I think your hymnal is all, what color is it? All blue. You know, I never, I don't know why they did this. Some hymnals are blue, some hymnals are red. And then I end up with a black one. How am I supposed to tell you what book to go to? <laughs> you know, it's very confusing. Page 594. And it ties in with that first, that last verse of the hymn we sang just before the gospel. Page 594. Okay. God of grace and God of glory. Remember? We humans in our arrogance think, oh, I'll stay with Jesus through the garden. I'll stay with Jesus through the judgment. Nothing will separate me from Jesus. Just don't talk about my politics, my money, or my family. Once you, you know, keep, I get to keep and take care of all of that. But Jesus has everything else. You know, think about it. Once you get rid of your, once you've kept your politics, your family, what was the other thing I said? Anyway, what's left? You know, it's your stray thoughts, right? But let's look at this hymn, page 594. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thy ancient church's story. Bring her bud, blood, bud to glorious fame. Then together, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage. Folks, just like Israel in Jeremiah's time, I would say you and I are facing an hour of decision and of choice that will decide whether God blesses or whether God has to reshape this great nation of ours. Second verse. Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn thy Christ assail his ways. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. From the fears that long have bound us, the fears of differences in, econ in economics, the fears of differences in faith, the fears of differences in language, the fears of differences in culture. From the fears that long have bound us, we must realize that our fears are the bondages that we have placed on ourselves. That does not mean the fears go away. I, I'm, I'm going to have a confession. Last night, I'm going to bed, I look out my window, and here are four what look like young black men walking down my street. I will tell you, I watched them, because it's not normal at 10.30 at night for four young black men to be walking down my street. Furthermore, they stopped in my driveway and were talking. And I thought, well, I guess if I see them start to come up my driveway or across the street of the driveway, maybe I better do something. Now, fortunately, I'm a somewhat sensitive person, and I realized my racism was right at the surface there. And I realized that these people absolutely deserved the benefit of the doubt, that they could be totally innocent, and so I needed to do nothing except keep my fear in check. Turned out what happened is two of them turned back and two of them went forward. I'm sure they had gathered together for a party or an evening together. And, and one couple, and it probably turned out it wasn't four young men, but probably two couples, and I just didn't notice that. And they walked them part way home. From the fears that bound us. 
freeze. The beginning, for me at least, is to be aware when I become fearful and to be aware enough to say to myself, hey, Chris, this is just your, you were raised, you were, you know, four black people together late at night, you, you need to be careful. You don't need to call the cops. We know we live in a country where there are a bunch of people that would have called the cops. And unfortunately, and even sadder, the cops might have really escalated the whole situation. And so two groups of people that were just walking you know, each other partway home would have ended up in some sort of horrible confrontation with power and authority because of my fear. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and grace. This nation has a problem. This nation has a life and death problem. This nation is in a fight for its very soul. And the only one that I see that can help get us out of this conundrum is God. And that is revealed when people like me recognize our fear and say, wait, look, don't act first. Third verse, in case it gets better. Cure thy children's warring madness Bend our pride to thy control. America's the greatest nation on the world of the world. What we say is what shall go. There's no pride there, is there? What makes us think that we're the greatest nation in the world? Really? Think about it. What makes us think that we are somehow better than everyone? What makes us think that somehow God is more on our side than everyone else's side? What kind of arrogance is that? And yet, I grew up with that. Um, I'm a citizen of the United States of America, the greatest nation that has ever existed in the world. You know what? Israel thought that too. And Jeremiah warned Israel what would happen to Israel if Israel didn't become humble and realize their dependence upon God and not God's dependence upon them? Shame our wanton, selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. If that does not describe the United States of America, I don't know what does. Rich in things and poor in soul. What do you suppose would have happened if Hurricane Doria had landed in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, instead of the Bahamas? Think. Would people have band together to help each other? Would, would nations reach out to the richest square mile in the United States to give them aid and support? Would they have any reason to? Would those people even accept the help? The, be the people of the Bahamas know what destruction is. They know what complete destruction is. And they know what reaching out to one another is. And they know that the only way they will rebuild, the only way they will overcome, is together. In dependence on one another and on the gifts of those who were not devastated. 
Shame our wanton, selfish gladness. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. God's kingdom's goal is not that the United States of America be able to do what it wants, when it wants, how it wants, where it wants. God's kingdom's goal is that God be recognized as the one on whom all are dependent, and that all recognize that they are dependent upon one another, that all people recognize that they are brothers and sisters regardless of race, age, religion, creed, education, economics. God's kingdom is one where every person is of value, complete in total value, so much value that Jesus, God's only Son, would die on the cross for. Think, how often do you or I treat the drunk stumbling along the road, the suspicious-looking person on the side of the road with a flat tire, as if they were a person beloved by God, and Jesus gave up his life for them. Save us, and this is why we need to sing this from every for every single Sunday, which we aren't going to do. But save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. You know, my my nephew said to me, you know, I, I'm stopping watching the news because it's just too too upsetting, and I just I need to concentrate on something else. That is what is hoped. That we will all become so discouraged and so distracted that we'll just go looking for other things and other places to be on November, the second Tuesday of November in 2020. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. What can we do about the children in concentration camps in the United States of America? What can we do about the sick people who are being deported to die in nations that they have never seen? We have become resigned that much as we don't like them, that is who we are and where we are. We feel helpless. Let the gift of thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore. You and I are all that God has. You and I have the responsibility to call our nation to return to ways of civility, to ways of hopefulness, to ways of justice, to ways of peace, to ways of love. We cannot resign ourselves to there's nothing we can do. Just wait until I tell you what to do.